I'm here with Naomi Rosenblatt in her home in Washington, D.C., and Naomi has agreed to talk about her life with me. Thank you very much, Naomi. Thank you for coming. Uh, let's start with your childhood. I know you were, grew up in Israel, so talk a little bit about that. Well, um, it's, this is like a baptism. It's the first time that I'm talking in public and mentioning my age. I grew up when that was not done. I never knew how old my mother was, my father was. We never talked about money. That was considered impolite and not subject for conversation. But at this point, I'm either letting it out or what's it all about. So I was born in 1933, and my father, uh, a historian by education, by temperament, always pointing to the, the, the context of that particular date, not the numbers. We didn't care about numbers. And the context was, he was always reminding me, tactlessly if I may add, even when I was very little, that I was born three weeks before Hitler came into power. And that's the reason I'm bringing in my birth, my, when I was born, because Hitler could not be kept out of the general perspective. And this was in Haifa, the land of Israel, as we call it in Hebrew, Eretz Israel, or as the English language, it was under the British at the time, was called Palestine. And I was born in Haifa, uh, Israel of those days. Again, I need to say something about my father and mother, and if you think that I'm talking too long, shut me up. My father came from Glasgow, Scotland. The family arrived in England in the 17th, early, early 1800s or 1700s from Holland to England. What's interesting about that, and we don't think about England in that context, she had kicked out the Jews in the 12th century, after the massacre of York, a ghastly memory, and when Cromwell came into power, he opened up the gates and the Jews were allowed in. And my great-great-great-grandfather, the Yiches in my family, was a chief rabbi of London. Um, so my fa And then the family moved to Manchester, to Glasgow, and my father... Uh, the, the family was traditional, no question about it, and kept a lot of the traditions, but the Glasgow com Jewish community was small, if I may say so, even maybe a little provincial, I don't know, but that was the message I got from my father. He, um, he graduated the University of Edinburgh, and then went on to the University of Rome, where he was studying the classics, and he spoke four languages or more, Italian, German, Russian, Hebrew and obviously English. Anyway, at the time, as he was studying there, a group of Russian Jewish idealists with their hair flying and so forth were on their way to Palestine of those days, Chalutzim, pioneers. This was a new animal he had never come across before, He's Eastern European rebels in many ways. And he decided, well, he'll go and see what's happening in Palestine, too. And it was under the British mandate. Do you know the year, approximately? 1920. Okay. Was he married? Uh, no. Mm -hmm. And um, he came to see what it was like. And he had British nationality, being Scottish, Scotland. And he came to Palestine of those days and fell in love with the whole idea of Jewish history, its continuity, its relationship with that country. And he always said, which I've never forgotten and I've used in my speeches and teachings, that the Jews have a homing like a bird, a homing instinct back to the nest, that it was just so natural to, to uh, settle in a way, even though there was a very small English-speaking Jewish population, uh, community then, it was mostly Eastern European. Anyway, he stayed on. My mother, and nobody else in his family came, and he always loved Scotland, by the way. It wasn't that he didn't like Scotland, but the idea of Israel and Jewish history and so forth talked to him more. My mother was born in Western Canada, Manitoba, Winnipeg, and her family, her father, I know more about that, my maternal grandfather on her side, left Russia when he was 17, Moses Abrahamson, you couldn't get a better name, and he went off to England. I, th I don't think he was married, I think maybe he was, I'm not sure, already by then. Came to England, fell in love with England, 
Why? A poor immigrant boy, highly intelligent, but no secular education of any kind, in fact, brilliant intellectually, but no formal education. He would walk in the streets of London, lose his way, and ask a British policeman where was the east side of London, Threadneedle Street, where the Jewish little Jewish population lived. I get goose pimples. And the British Bobby, the policeman, would jump off the horse and walk for a few... I'll get over this. It's not sad, it's just touching. I'm not opening it. Would walk for... Oh, wait, can you put this off for me? The policeman would jump off the horse and walk for a few blocks to show him. My grandfather was so touched coming from Russia with a czarist tradition that that they would have kicked him in rather than jump off a horse. <clears throat> so for him to have somebody in authority to jump off a horse and take him for a few blocks. So every few blocks he did the same thing to see what it felt like. So he fell for England, that was it. But he decided that with a name like Moses Abrahamson, it was too cohesive a society for him to, to really feel that he could ever belong. And at that time, the English were doing two things. They gave people who wished homesteading in Western Canada. You got land, and if you worked it, it was yours. It was 50 below zero, so very tough, no central heating. And then in 1916, the British, under the Balfour Declaration, came out saying that they're in favor of helping the Jews reestablish their ancient homeland. My grandfather moved with a few of the children by then to Winnipeg. His only son became a Rhodes Scholar. That's from a Yiddish-speaking family, not bad. I mean, I'm so proud of it. And of the level of intellect without secular education. He had been in Yeshivot, in the Cheder. And uh, when the British came out, and he was elected to the Board of Education of Winnipeg. In fact, the people in Winnipeg, then all immigrants from Ireland, Ukraine, there was a religious sect that came there, the Dukabors, they thought he was talking in Hebrew, because he just his language was not great, it was Yiddish. Yiddish and English, that's how he campaigned. After the British came out with their declaration in 1916, he said, I'm leaving. This is now the third country that he was wandering from one place to another, and he asked the girls. There were three sisters by then. The wife obviously would go with him. Nobody ever asked her what she wanted, and it didn't occur to her. It wasn't that she was angry under that. She, that was the way it was done. And uh, the three girls, oh yes, they would love to go. Not for great religious reasons. I don't think even that Zionist. The idea of going to a warm climate, the Mediterranean, and anyway, to go with their father. So they came to Palestine of those days, 1920. Eventually, my mother and father, belonging to the English-speaking community, got to know each other, married, and eventually begot me. We lived in Haifa. You ask me if I'm what skipping. Your, what did your father do? My father there? was an... No, at first he worked on, I guess you'd call it PR today, uh, for the Rothschild Foundation that was called PICA. The Rothschilds, the French Rothschilds, uh, bought land mm -hmm. and settled people. That's Roshpina up in the Galilee was theirs, and the first wine cellars in Zichon Yaakov, that was the Rothschilds. And so he worked in that foundation. P-I-C-A was the acronym. Okay. But then he became an art critic. That was really his first love. And when he retired very young from Pika, the Rothschild thing, till the end of his life, it was art, and he wrote for the Jerusalem Post for the rest of his life. So he was an, an, an intellectual. Oh, completely. Uh -huh. My two parents, we never discussed money. Uh -huh. They feasted on ideas, argued about it, loved about it. So what, what do you remember of, of life in, during the Mandate period? I remember two periods, and I can cut it with a knife, like a cake, two levels. The first was the beginning of the Second World War, that's 1941-42. Our house was full of British officers who were stationed then in Haifa. They'd come at five o'clock, nobody stayed for dinner because you were rationed. My mother would sit with the, this great hostess with her ginger snaps and tea, 
and uh, the house was full of these central casting looking individuals, I mean these officers, and they always helped clear the table, I mean they were, their manners were terrific and formal but great, and we were, we loved the British, I mean they were fighting the Germans, and had they not fought the Germans in the African theatre with Rommel, and that was before you were dreamt of, they, would, they were coming up through Egypt, up to Palestine, and they would have gobbled us up, because we were a Jewish community, and it was at that theatre in Africa that the German armies were stopped from coming in. Anyway, so we were very close. My parents spoke English, this was English. It was all very comfortable, endless cups of tea, great conversation. And they were brave because they were going off to war. So you always had that, that war is always like a Greek chorus. It gives everything a sense of intensity. I remember one of them who came a lot to the house said goodbye. I remember running to the bedroom and crying. He was going off to the battles in Italy and then he was killed. So, I mean, there's always that in the background. However, in 1940, and I was very young, I didn't really know what was going on with the Haganah that was slowly getting organized very quietly, but we were still with the British. When war was over, the, sec the Second World War, or the Great War, the way it's called, Jewish immigration was being stopped from coming into the country. And the remnant of Jewry from Europe, these wretched immigrants, and I say wretched, I say it with love and compassion, so traumatized from their losses, so different than us, the born Israelis, that never knew anything like that. They were coming in, and I remember after 46, the relationship with the British stopped. No more people came into our house. And every so often there was these illegal ships coming into the Haifa port and then in the middle of the night they would be smuggled in and the Haganan and the younger group, the Palmach, uh, distributed them all over the kibbutzim. So the next day when the British would come to see where are these illegal immigrants, you couldn't recognize them. They were, so you had these stories all the time. Did you have a sense of, of living through a, a moment of history, or were you too young to appreciate that? From the minute, the school that I went to, Reali, R-E-A-L-I, really shaped me in many ways, my family too, but they, I was always aware, without being chauvinistic, that I was unique as a sabre, no question about it. When I walked down the street to my school, I was aware of the blue sky, I was aware of the blue Mediterranean. I felt as free as could be, so strong, so... I felt unique, not arrogant. People don't understand that about the Israelis. It's not a matter of arrogance, it's a matter of self-confidence that emerges out of a series of overcoming huge difficulties, prevailing, prevailing, and that we were always so small in number. I mean, we had a company, and we, I felt that. I used to wear a, we had, we had a badge on our school uniform, a sentence out of the prophet Micah. But underneath it, my mother had to sew a yellow badge so we could identify with what the Jews in Europe had to wear. But whereas for them it was to humiliate them, for us it was tremendous self-confidence. I couldn't believe that I was so fortunate not because I was great, but out of the fact that my parents, out of, that I was part of this generation. <clears throat> my secret, in a way, I've only begun to connect the dots. I could identify more easily with the biblical characters, the Davids, the Abigails, the Sarahs, the Jacobs, than with, my, than with European history in the last 2,000 years of diaspora, basic on and off persecution. You, you, so at, at this age, you were already identifying with the biblical heroes. Yeah, but unselfconsciously. Mm -hmm. And I didn't come from a very, my family wasn't observant at all. Mm -hmm. The connection was always with a biblical text. This was our history, that's why we're in this land. Otherwise, we could have gone off to Tanganyika, which was suggested mm -hmm. to us, with no problems, lots of water, eventually oil. But this is, the language was mine, the land was mine, the characters were mine, and I identified with Rebecca and her problems, 
And with David, and always had a soft spot for him. I always thought I'd run off with him if he ever had. I'm putting this in in exaggerated terms. So, do, do you remember the the War of Independence? Yes, yeah, of, course. of course. I must have been what fifty. One of the first, what's so interesting about our upbringing, which is so different than what you see in the countries surrounding us in Israel, we weren't. The word revenge never entered the vocabulary. Hatred, per se, never entered the, the, the I don't know, there could have been more right-wing, Etzel, Irgun. I'm, I, that wasn't my upbringing. My upbringing was Haganah and then Palmach. Those were our, my heroes, and I'll soon tell you about that because it's so important. But So we were being prepared in our school. We used to stand for hours. <laughs> Uh, in the schoolyard, we had a uniform on, and when the state was declared, I remember our principal, a very well-known man, Dr. Biram, a German Jew, actually somebody left and said he was still a Prussian in many ways, uh, stood in front of us, and we were sweating by an, for more than an hour listening, and he said, they're going to be, and that's how we were always brought up. It was never emphasis on victory, nitzachon, never, it was of overcoming prevailing. Those were the verbs. It's very important to remember that. And he said, this is, new. this is going to take more than a hundred years before everything settles down. There have to be difficulties. You can't create something new. And it's not without the difficulties and the endless, of course, sacrifices, sacrifices, sacrifices. And that will go on. And as we stand like this in our start uniform, the sweat underneath my armpits, and the responsibilities on your shoulders. You're responsible for this and for the Jewish people. We were always brought up with that sense of responsibility. And what I realize today is the more he heaved it on us, the broader our shoulders became. It, it, it gave you a sense that you were bigger than just little Nomi Harris living opposite the Persian gardens in Haifa. You think that you, you still carry that feeling with you It today. was put into my DNA. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that I've done anything or that I've lived up to it or fulfilled it, no. But that that was there, no question about it. And we studied the Bible because that was our history. Nobody asked me if I believed in God. Mm -hmm. This was taught. And nobody asked me about Kashrut. Do you think there's an Israeli personality? Mm-hmm. Just as there's a Jewish, per obviously part of the Israeli part of personality is Jewish personality, but there is a uniqueness about it because of the history. I lost, you asked me about the War of Independence, and I'll show you this picture. My mother's sister, Canadian, also by sheer coincidence happened to, to marry a Scottish Jew. They had an only son, Danny, charming, handsome, palmach. And it, he was seven years older than me, so his history was born in Haifa, then they moved to Jerusalem. Uh, he uh, joined the Jewish Brigade. They were bringing over these, the remnant, that's the only way to call them, that they got out of the lion's den, uh, brought them to Israel, Palestine, illegally. Then when that was done, and then the War of Independence was starting, he asked the Palmach that he was part of, can he now go to England to study uh, marine biology? And they said, no, we need you here. That was that. So he joined the Palmach. His last conversation with his mother, who they were in Jerusalem during the siege, he said to his, his mother said to him, because his father was very high up in the British mandate as a Jew, but it, she said to him, Danny, Daddy was just offered a high position in England because of his British nationality if he wants to leave as the state was being declared. And Danny's last words, because I'll soon tell you he was killed, Danny's last words were, tell Daddy that if he ever leaves this country, I will never talk to him again. That was his last words. Then he joined the kibbutz, Palmach, Again, they were really heroes that we should bring in to Jewish education here as somebody to look up to. Uh, the war broke, and he was the head of, of security in this tiny little kibbutz overlooking the Lake of Galilee, the Kinneret. 
And we had no arms then, nothing, when the Arabs all attacked. People always forget that. And a truck went by of the Palmach looking for volunteers to go down to the Jordan Valley. And Danny took six boys with him. And his last words to them were, don't worry, I'll bring them all back. Well, he was the only one who was brought back dead. And he was bur buried overlooking the Lake of Galilee. And then eventually the uh, army moved him to the uh, military uh, place up in Jerusalem because his mother was going nuts, going to this lonely grave. It was like a Greek tragedy. And she said, Danny's all alone up there. So, well, so you talk about, so the Israeli is different. I think the ultimate pressure that maybe you might give your life for what you, how many of us have to give our own life for what we believe in? We're never tested to such a degree. Yeah. And then you, you so you, you grew up during, during this very um, tumultuous and significant but, yes. time in, in uh, Israeli and in Jewish right. history. And then you, you uh, lived, the, lived the rest of your adult life in, in the States, the married to an American. Peter came to Israel in 1949. He was 15, had just lost his mother. And he came as a visitor. His father didn't know what to do with him. He was difficult. He was taciturn, cranky, had just lost his mother. People didn't go to therapy in those days. Not that that always makes such a difference. And we were introduced because... His aunt said, look, uh, there's a little girl down the street, Nomi Harris, she talks English, do you want to... From the minute we met, that was the beginning and the end. I brought him into my youth movement, which, by the way, is another very important element in what shaped me. And he was with me with my uh, group, and we went out to a kibbutz every summer to work on the land. It really was like that. Peter grew up in, in New York, went to Riverdale Country School for Boys. At that time, the family lived in the Plaza Hotel. So going to this little new kibbutz up in Galilee, we used, it was all new. But he was so tactful, never, never mentioned the fact that he was living on any other standard of living. It didn't occur to me even. So I, to me, I was it, in the sense of Israel, in the sense of my uniqueness. Always aware of that uniqueness, or being chosen in biblical terms, but heavy with responsibility. Mm -hmm. There was never arrogance tied to it, because the price is always so heavy. Do you feel you have two homes? I don't know how, I, I don't even, never, that's such a good question. I've never even allowed myself to put it that way. I always say in, in my diary now, leaving Israel is like leaving a teenager that hasn't really finished growing up yet. You always feel responsible. You always want to know. You all, and I love it. It's part of me. It's, it's who I am. That's the basis. On the other hand, I was brought up by a Canadian mother who was a great nationalist when it came to Israel. No ambivalence of any kind. Nobody would cross our doorstep if they were too critical. But she also recited Emma, Emma Lazarus's thing, Give, bring me your tired and your, and so forth. And so there's a love for this country. No, there is a deep love for this country. And I always say, if there was, God forbid, America was attacked, my children would have to go to war. I'm not talking about Afghanistan or Iraq or whatever. If this land was attacked, I um, Am I worried about the Jewish community in this country? You bet. Because I think it's very different. Mm -hmm. To me today, if you would ask me, Nomi, what is your sense, what's your purpose now at this point in life, is the, the concept of identity. How do you forge a Jewish identity in a highly seductive society and secular, mm -hmm. no matter what they call it? It's so seductive. And in a country where choice is turned into an idol, and you can choose to be a Shinto or I don't know, whatever, I think for a minority that's less than 2% of the population, so much is left to the individual parent to decide what identity they want to transmit and how will they do it. Mm -hmm. The last thing I'll say on this is growing up in Washington, watching the presidents, each president 
is part of the country, but each one has its own his own womb. So Kennedy always had his Irish mafia. Uh, Carter had his uh, southern people. Johnson, the Padronales, and so forth. Yes, he had a lot of Jewish brains all around to help for Roosevelt. But when Roosevelt went to relax on his boat, he had the good old boys from boarding school. So we must have a womb. And we must give them their own identity Jewish, but you have to do so much about it. You can't just sit back the way you can in Israel. That is the big, big advantage of growing up there. My mother never had to worry whom I would marry. Mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. So in, in the United States, do you, did you ever feel, when, when you came, did you feel like an outsider or a minority and getting acculturated was right. a difficult thing? Well, what's interesting, and everybody can only talk about their own case, Peter was then going into his junior year at Yale, where a lot of the people were like Bush's father. I'm just giving that as a reference point. Very much part of a cohesive. I liked them very much. I got along with them better than I did with my Jews from uh, who were at Yale at that time. The Wasp was very similar to me. He had his identity, I had my identity. And I went to a very good school in Israel, so I wasn't impressed by the standard, academic standard of Yale. I felt that I could contribute to them. I mean, that's part of Israeli uh, self-confidence, but which I'm afraid I'm going to lose, I'm losing maybe. But um, again, never arrogance. Um, so, but when it struck me that I had to make a decision that I needed to belong, especially coming from the commun communal sense of life in Israel, which is unbeatable, unbeatable. That was during Christmas. That really hit me below the belt. There they were walking around singing the carols, which are out of this world. They're so beautiful. They tear your heart apart. They're so full of longing and longing. And I hear them talking about the uh, king of Israel. I, I didn't know what they were talking about. I thought it was my Israel and my king, like David, the Jewish uh, folk song, uh, David, king of Israel. Anyway, and then I said to Peter, I have to belong to something. What do I belong to? I'm not them, and I don't want to be them. And the last thing on that is we went to a party then of somebody from the Our Crowd group, a Lehman, in New York, magnificent townhouse, Renoir's Matisse's on the wall and a huge, magnificent Christmas tree. And Mrs. Lehman greets us at the door, Merry, Merry Christmas. And I was wondering to myself, what is she so merry about? The birth of that very interesting Jewish boy in Bethlehem has given us 2,000 years of such misery and you're celebrating his birth. And then what was Christmas? to most of the Jews of New York. I went to the second floor in the plaza and looked at Bergdorf Goodman, and there were hundreds of women standing the day after Christmas to give back their gifts. Anyway, so the Bible is my access to my identity. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about your career. Now, I, I think of you as having dual interests and in careers. One is as a, a psychotherapist, and the other is as a, a Bible scholar. Which came first? You know, I, because I'm a therapist, I always have to go back and back and back. When I left Israel then, I had nothing with me because we didn't buy things at that time. But one of the things I took with me was my Bible, even though I didn't open it, but it was mine. And then I... As I look back now, friends of mine remind me that in New York, when we lived for 10 years, I began talking about it, but I don't remember sufficiently if I did have a group around the table or not. And then I taught while we were, Peter was at Yale, and I was sent then to New Haven State Teachers College. I began teaching Bible and Hebrew in a, little, in a synagogue in Waterbury, Connecticut. So obviously it was there all the time. I had not institutionalized it as yet. Then when I came to Washington and Peter joined the government and my mother always brainwashed me to get a profession where I can support myself in case of, always. I mean, she was a lawyer when she left Canada, my mother. Um, I went to a Catholic university to get my degree. There is no question in my mind 
that the study of the Bible and the approach in which we were taught it, with its emphasis on the humanity of individuals, neither being good nor bad, but brought me to therapy. And that's when I started. And I love my psychotherapy practice. So you, the two mesh together. Yeah, it was human nature being discussed from different aspects. Do you, do you think psychotherapy is a, a Jewish endeavor? Yeah. Explain. One of my gods with a small g is Freud, and Jews don't understand him. He was a Jew through... The fact that he didn't transmit it to the next generation is the part that upsets me. But he had no question or ambivalence about who he was. He rebelled. He was a scientist. Anything you'd give him, he'd be questioning. But his father studied the Bible in Hebrew, his mother and came from a long line. And his... The biblical tradition of hundreds of years of constantly interpreting and interpreting and peeling the onion is what prepared Freud for psychoanalysis. And he took the biblical point of view about human nature, the id, the, 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 and so forth, and then refining it through laws and your conscience and God, and it became psychoanalysis. That was his genius. Do you, do you feel that... Um... Your, your approach is to, in your books, you've spoken about the, the, uh, the biblical heroes as being really very human and flawed people. Um, in a modern age, when we're looking all around us for people to inspire us right. and, and lead us, why do you think people still come back to the Bible? Right. I, I mean, I, these are so profound, your questions. They're very good, and it's, I don't want to answer superficially. I first would say that the Bible approaches us, the reader of the biblical narrative, as adults. Right from the start, they're not diet, deities or deities, however you pronounce it right. So we're already drawn into the text with respect. Here we hear about David's uh, lust, and we hear about poor Sarah's uh, jealousy of that Hagar, and on and on. However, at the end, they prevail. Even without telling you that David remains king, God doesn't take him off the throne, uh, Sarah's children are eventually the ones who continue the Jewish tradition, and it's not against Hagar. She marries her son off to an Egyptian girl, and eventually they found the oil. So there's nothing to be all these Jewish women are so upset about Hagar. And that you can read my book. I feel very differently about it. But Sarah, in the end, prevails. Hagar prevails. And because Jewish continuity is so important, the fact that those first four mothers, our uh, founding mothers, in the end, you and I are here today. That's their victory. What was the ingredients that they put in that got us to continue, even though we argue about Rebecca's choice and was Rachel too jealous of her sister? Or despite their feet of clay, they overcame and they prevailed. Do you think this is, has a parable in modern Israel, Israeli history as well? What do you mean? Well, when you spoke about uh, what you were taught as a, as a schoolgirl, to um, not to give up and to uh, that's all biblical his burden. right it's or biblical in origin look we're soon I, I worry about my Jews in this country so much we're soon I mean our kids go to universities with a whole Muslim contingency today that has a strong Muslim identity there's passion there our kids don't have that passion unless they're very religious to protect their identity. Without passion, a tiny group cannot survive. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you're better, it has nothing to do with being better or worse. And I think that the biblical, the judges, again, David, Saul, these were people who, who, what did David do his whole life? He was protecting the borders. When I taught on the hill to the group of senators, I used to say to them, we're learning now about David, Nothing has changed. We're still busy protecting the borders. So I'd like to talk about your, your Hill study classes. This is uh, something that people who are, that you're kind of famous for, is leading a, a weekly right. Bible study class on, on the Hill. How did that come about? 
First of all, we kept it secret because I wanted those... I'm a therapist, so anything I do, nobody ever knew who was there or that. We had Republicans, Democrats. Were uh, they all Jewish? No, the Jews are always the minority in everything. They don't... You know, it takes a long time for them to... Mormons, Catholics, but I taught a Jewish. This is my Bible. I don't make any uh, bones about it. And as an Israeli a background, certainly knowing those places and everything, and the language. Arlen Specter, who's just now retired, was with Peter a few years older in law school. When he won his first election, we all had dinner together, and I said to him, Arlen, the hill is full of these Bible classes, mostly evangelical. Nobody even knows about it. You can't, in England, the parliament isn't filled with people studying the Bible, or France. It's just in this country, it's so important. And we're the ones who began, began the tradition of study and interpretation. That's why we're such good psychotherapists, constantly interpreting and reinterpreting. Mm -hmm. And who's... So he turns to me out of the blue. That was Arlen Specter. He, what is it? He walked where angels feared to tread. And he said, no, me, why don't you start? There kicks in the Israeli upbringing. <laughs> I can hear my mother saying, no, me, what, what came on you? Why did you, whatever? Anyway, and I said, well, of course, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll do whatever I'm, I'm asked to do. So I took my Bible. And I said to him, Arlen, I don't know one senator from another. They really don't mean that much to me. <laughs> Certainly not in their face. He said, don't worry. I'll get the senators. You do the teaching. So the next week, with my Bible, like Elmer Gantry, I went into the elevator of the Senate and started. And we had 10, usually a, a 10. Then some of the spouses started coming. And it went on for till very recently when the security makes it too difficult. Were there particular Torah stories or Bible stories that they were um, most responsive to or interested in? Two things. First of all, the ethics and the incredible democratic... My point was to show them how democracy and its seeds comes from our Bible and that the founding fathers of this country understood it and used it in their vision for the new America, the new world. Because that was my agenda, too. I, I wanted to push something. Uh, so I, I wanted to show that. And then we, get, we got, for example, this is a little example, of David lusting for Bathsheba. And it was the time that our Billy Clinton was busy with one of our <laughs> girls, Monica. And so one of the discussions there, and we brought it to a high level, it wasn't about the giggling or anything, to what degree do you judge a leader by how he conducts his very personal life? Is there a, a crossover? I asked my father that about Dayan, the general with the black patch, who was a rather kind of popular ladies' man. My father said, no, there's no, uh, you can't judge a person by, by so forth and so on. Just as my father would say, you can't judge Henry VIII because of what he did with his wives. He was great for England. So uh, we came to Billy Clinton, and, um, and, and we discussed that, the, the connection or lack of it between private life and governance. And that was a great discussion. And then, again, again, the Ten Commandments, how basic. You can't strip them away anymore because they're down to the basics. And they were taken, the non-Jewish ones, by this freedom to question and interpret without being allowed to take out one word out of the biblical narrative or add a word. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it would be Reader's Digest. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that people look, come to the Bible and interpret it as a reflection of themselves? I think that it also depends on the teacher. And if I may say so, I think a good teacher, if you can arrive at that, is able to give two messages. One, that this, the teacher, the Jewish teacher, that this is a holy book that you love and revere in its entirety. And the freedom again. Only we are given that, that difficulty, if you will, to interpret and reinterpret and reinterpret and make it your own. By interpreting and interpreting and getting involved in these people's lives, as the Bible exposes, they become yours. You identify with Rebecca. What should we do with one child who's difficult and one child who's responsible? 
Is there a, a, a Bible character that you particularly identify with? I love, well, there are two. I identify with Rebecca's loneliness, I assume, of leaving everybody in her part of the world and joining a family with that strong mother-in-law in the background, although she's dead by then, Sarah. A husband much older and the difficulties. Of, I identify with her on that, that loneliness which I had to deal with. The woman that I highly respect because I like her self-confidence, that doesn't mean always arrogant, self-confidence, intelligence. When she deals with David, that's Abigail, when he's about to destroy her family. It's, I think, chapter 25 in Samuel 2. Anyway, she's a great woman. That's why President Adam's wife, Abigail, is just like her. It was, they knew their Bible better than most of us, our Bible. And the way she handles David, who's about to murder her husband and the whole sort of hacienda on which she lives, her savageness, her tact, her diplomacy, and in the end, she prevails. And he acknowledges that she has saved him from spilling blood. And that's one of the pedagogical lessons on his way to becoming our greatest king in the past, but full of feet of clay. Mm -hmm. What do you learn from your Torah study groups? About them or? No, just in, in general, what do you, what, if, I would if, say, if, anything. if they're Jews, which 99% are Jews, I feel that they leave my classes, using a cliche now, a cliche, six feet tall, because they suddenly connect to a history that they never knew of. It's their history. I mean, we are so lucky to have this ancient document. There is no other people in the world that has it. And we have archaeology today. I mean, it's, it's an unusual, look, we are unique, difficult, pains in the neck, is, is stiff neck for sure, but this is ours. So they go away with a very strong sense of their Jewish identity, free to keep any level of observance that they want. The second thing is the spiritual message, that, that there are things bigger than ourselves, and a trans I hope that I convey a transcendent sense of what we're doing. Are, are you ever surprised at the interest people show in, in wanting to participate in, in learning about the Torah? No, I'm upset when they don't show interest. I'm upset that they don't show interest. And I go to anywhere that I can to spread the word. That's my calling. That's my war path. And your books, uh, you've written two wonderful books, Wrestling with Angels, about the, uh, the characters. In, in the Genesis. first four generations mm -hmm. of Genesis. Mm -hmm. And then after the apple, that's 17 chronicling the lives of 17 women, interpretation of a modern woman, but always based on the discipline. That's where we're, of the narrative. Mm -hmm. And that's where the rub comes in. Do you think that being, being a woman affects how you see these stories? No question about it. No question about it. The fact that the rabbis had the gall, or the chutzpah, and I say this with love for them, the gall, to tell Sarah that she shouldn't have, I don't know, kicked Hagar out after she was carrying on with her husband right next door. And any woman worth her salt would want to protect her marriage, whatever the price is. Or being angry with uh, Rachel that she was punished by God because she didn't wait long enough uh, to become fertile, that where was her faith? Or the same thing with uh, Rebecca, was her choice correct? Should she have had more faith and let God intervene? I get very upset because I totally identify with the women. That doesn't mean that I don't feel compassion for Jacob, who didn't know how to deal with Rachel and her pain, or Abraham, who didn't know how to deal with Sarah's jealousy, even though he was perfectly, she's the one who suggested to bring in a concubine. I identify, and with Abigail, God, if one of the people, with anybody who's got a child who wants to be a cinematographer, the story of Abigail and David and how she handles him in that speech. There's no soliloquy in Shakespeare that's more brilliant than Abigail's speech to David. And all of us should study it, the role of diplomacy and tact. Mm -hmm. So she was an early feminist. Abigail, yeah, yeah. without having to have a label. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not angry at the men, and, and you have to judge every generation by the context of, of their period. Mm -hmm. Do you consider yourself a feminist? I don't have labels. I was in the Navy, in the Israeli Navy. I always felt equal to the men around me, but that was my mother. My mother, had she been maybe lived in England, would have been a suffragette. On the other hand, my mother always talked about the difficulty that men have, at least of her generation, of proving themselves, the competitive world that they're thrown in on. And ultimately, she would say, we make children, we have something that nobody can take away from us. The male doesn't have that. And she was always um, very compassionate about their issues. I was never brought up to compete with men. Mm -hmm. I was what I was to the best of my ability. So I, I, I think you were very progressive in, in that way, having a career and... But that was Israeli upbringing mm -hmm. again. That was my school. Mm -hmm. Did you find it difficult to combine work and family? Yes. You're always guilty, always. It goes with the territory. There's nothing we can do about it. Mm -hmm. Peter was in Vietnam then when he worked in the White House. Often, yeah, he, I don't think he was conflicted as much as any time I'm with a patient while the children are still at home after school. What, what advice would you give to young, a young Jewish woman? Well, now I sound sort of cliche-ridden. Before anything or doing, learn your history. Learn your history. You've got role models in the Bible. You can agree with them or not, but they're yours. They're your personal property. They're your grandmothers. Okay, we move away from that. And I would say that women should remember that their lives are sequential. We are unique. We are unique. The male doesn't have the choices that we do, at least from my uh, uh, get a very good education, find a direction that you can be passionate about to whatever degree you prepare in that particular direction. Anything, zoology, painting, uh, running a, a business, anything. Find a direction. Today we get married much later. Maybe that's good, although you've got the biological clock. We're not, there's no, there's no free lunch, as they say in Washington. And the idea is to balance everything. And, and that in itself is a lifelong quest, which in a way is challenging. Mm -hmm. At this age, talking about myself for a change, I've got grandchildren in another city. I've got a marriage here. My husband's still very involved and so forth. I'm dying to be with those grandchildren. Do I leave him and go off to the grandchildren? And what about my work? Women are always conflicted, but I think the goal is that you can have it all if you acknowledge the opposite, that life is a balance, that having it all is arriving at the peace of knowing that this is what life is about. It's not supposed to be a plateau where you can uh, just sort of uh, fall asleep and be relaxed. No, life is, a plateau. Uh, life is not a plateau. And if you can arrive at the peace that you as a woman have a certain uniqueness because if you wish to have children, that it's sequential, you start education, start a career, or at least a direction you have to take. You might have to take time off for children. I think they need you. And today, if I may add one more propaganda to my Bible, with Sarah, she's such a great example. We are, without, we are beyond menopause longer than we, ever, we have ever, ever been in history. 20, 30 years. So if you have some foundation on which you can come back to when people are upset about the emptiness, then if you've neglected your marital relationship and then you're alone when the children leave, then what is there? Have you completely destroyed that intimacy that you can enrich or devote more time to? It's not going to suddenly fall from the sky like manna. It always there has to be a level of awareness. And because, and when you read Sarah, she starts being part of a new calling, a new religion, when she, it's the Bible, I mean, just read what's in there. It's after she has uh, 
She's beyond childbearing age. They don't use that miserable word, menopause. It's more poetic. After childbearing age. And she and Abraham start a whole new religion. There is nothing like that in any other faith where a middle-aged woman takes on a calling. And that's an example for mm -hmm. us. Prepare, prepare for when they leave the nest. Mm -hmm. Just a couple more questions. Yes, please. Um, You're a great questioner. You're patient and you, get, you probe. In an earlier conversation that we had, you said something that I wrote down because it, I found it very meaningful. And you said that to be Jewish is to be resilient in the face of injustice. Right. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, I feel that very deeply. Again, going back to that Genesis, when you do Adam and Eve, one of the first lessons is that the first line of defense is to scapegoat somebody else. Adam accuses her, she accuses him, etc. When we bring it now to Jewish history, I think we're a metaphor to all of that. We're a tiny minority wherever we are. So now politically, when other countries are upset about their poverty, about whatever, who's the scapegoat? We, and we're put together with America, which is a joke. America, huge and rich, we're six million in Israel, and everything we have was done through uh, character and so forth. And there is injustice. There's constant injustice. We've just come out of the Second World War. We lost six million individuals. When you're a member of such a tiny group, you are always subjected somewhere along the line to being scapegoated for somebody else's problems, resentment, jealousy, and so forth. I traveled with my husband in Europe last summer, and I suddenly looked at him and I said, you know, there's no country in Europe where we haven't been exiled from. This is Holland in the Second World War, Anna Frank. So what am I going to do, become bitter about the world? No. We've got Israel today, thank God. We're not just a group of minorities meandering around the world at the mercy of any dictator or any change of mood as we see in England today. And you cannot become bitter. Instead, go back to who you are, appreciate it, uh, respect it, be proud of it, and now I feel I'm talking too many cliches. But, right, being Jewish is living with the ability to live with injustice and yet hold on to your ideals. One last question. I, no, I, continue. I love this. <laughs> Don't stop. I love this. I, I know you're working on a, a personal memoir. As you, what do you, are you reflecting on as you, as you do that? It's built around, the kernel is an authentic diary. It's like a historical document that I kept day by day, day by day, from 1947, a year before the state, into 52, into my marriage in America. And, it's a, and I look back, it's a story of a generation who planted the seeds for who Israel is today and for us in the diaspora to gain strength from, to help, to be critical this whole rich relationship that goes back to biblical times. We haven't invented this bond between Israel and a diaspora Jewry. It's a combination of pride, joy, and aching pain. I can't describe it any other way. And uh, that's, that's the combination. Tremendous joy. What's more joyous than sitting in a crowded cafe in Tel Aviv? It's so full of vitality. But the price is, has been, for anything that you love, you must pay a price. Because it, 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 it. But also grateful, um, right, I'm not answering you exactly. So that's the diary, those years. I'm writing now a long introduction about the years previous to that, my particular upbringing and what was going on in the country. It's not so much about me, it's only important because it gives you a tapestry of something else. And I'm doing an afterword with what you're asking. And I'm quoting Gluckel of Hamelin. I don't know if you ever read it, a wonderful diary of a German Jewish woman in the 17th century, where she also says, you must have a rudder in life, you must have a, your compass. Go back to the Torah, 
because she, she was very orthodox, which I'm not. Go, but she and I, I give anything, give a few years of my life to talk to her, study it, because that's the rudder. That's the rope on which you hang on to when the life is stormy. Or as today, if you're a Zuckerman and you're so bloody rich, what are your obligations, whomever you marry, to the generations that brought you to the point that you're today? Genes, curiosity, analytical. He is very much a product of a particular group, mm -hmm. if he knows it or not. Mm -hmm. And I think that American Jews, yes, have an obligation, obviously, to the country in which we live, no question about it, but always to our own background. That's Israel and to our uh, heritage. Or we're nothing. If you love everybody, in the end, you love nobody. Thank you very much. But come back. <laughs>